I'm joined today by Jamie DeWolf. He's a poet, comedian, writer, producer, director, and also the great grandson of the founder of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard. Jamie, very, very excited to talk to you. Let's just start at the very beginning. What's it like growing up as the great grandson of the founder of Scientology? Were you ever a Scientologist? No, zip zero. My uh, my grandfather was L. Ron Hubbard Jr. and he was a Scientologist. Was actually one of the kind of his right hand man um, for many years in the early days of the church, and then eventually left the church and ended up changing his last name from Hubbard to DeWolf, and then sort of had like a final third act of his life battling against his father and trying to flush him out of hiding. Um, so growing up. Um, when my grandfather was still alive, Scientology was actually something that we didn't really talk about because I was the oldest grandchild, and all I understood is that Elron was a writer, and that to me was very inspirational right. as a kid because I wanted to be a writer, and he had all these amazing books I could find in bookstores, um, you know, with all kinds of amazing three-headed aliens and rocket ships on them, and and. You know, growing up as a as a crazy little kid who was always typing away, that was very inspiring to me. And I had a very vivid memory of knowing who Elron was um, for really as long as I can remember. I got, you know, I had a 10 volume Mission Earth set that like dominated part of my bookshelf when I was, you know, really young. And I would type next to it and sort of use it as inspiration. But literally then with no internet or anything else, um, the fact that he ended up creating a religion um, didn't quite come up until a lot later. <laughs> so let's talk about that, right? I mean, what you've expressed very strong and critical views of Scientology. You've talked about pyramid scheme. You've talked about a very intelligent sort of evil, malicious overman. You, you've, you've had, you know, you have very strong views about this. At what point did it go from, oh, it's a writer who writes cool science fiction that I'm inspired by to, oh, there's this whole other thing here. Well, bizarrely, it was growing up, um, it was almost kept from all the kids hmm. in a way because it, they, they really wanted us to escape. They didn't, want it, they didn't want it to be our fate as well. And so for most of my aunts and uncles, they tried to keep their children as far away from it as possible. They had changed their own names. They didn't want to talk about it. And as the oldest and most inquisitive kid, about this subject, um, you know, I started asking more and more questions. And when I was really young, um, I grew up Baptist and I actually got a book on cults um, oh boy. From, from my reverend um, at church. And in this book, I'm flipping through it and came to a picture of Al Ron Hubbard, the same, the same picture that I had seen um, on one of my aunt's, you know, walls um, for a brief period. Eventually, it had been taken down. And that was when I, I was like, well, Mom, what is this Scientology thing? And her face went really pale, you know, when I asked her about it. And she was really worried. She thought at first people were following me. Mm. And then I showed her the book and I started asking her questions. And she she was definitely like, you know, someday when you're a little bit older. And I, I kept asking questions in my family and I still do. There's There's some members of my family that won't really talk about it at all um, and they've been watching very carefully um, what has or hasn't happened to me simply by being public about it. Um, I'm pretty much the last member of my family that will go on record about it. I do know that and at first it became a way of trying to understand who I was and just who I was in my family. I grew up red hair, you know, redhead and me and my brother were both the two only real redheads of the family and the oldest, and we were both totally little whack jobs growing up and incredibly manic and incredibly verbal and hyper. And um, and then later when we became sort of insane adolescents, um, it became even more of a factor of me trying to figure out like, all right, well, if my great grandfather was a cult leader, people say he's crazy. Well, what kind of crazy was he? You know, I mean, who was this guy? You know, and, and really trying to discover who he actually was as a human being past all of the myth that he had propagated about himself. And and that's when it just goes further and further down the rabbit hole. And I'm still asking. Um, I've had a lot of meetings, um, you know, in secret and some in public um, with ex-members, people who knew him personally, trying to get a real sense of who this guy actually was. So let's go to that. I mean, what's the kind of succinct 
summary if you had to say what is Scientology what was why was it created and and what is its validity as a as a quote religion whatever that means to to any individual what's the kind of view you've developed well I think that Elron um, I think that the jury is still out even in me in terms of what actually was motivating him I do think that it was larger than money um, I I don't think it was to help mankind um, I definitely think it was it was more of a pursuit of power and more that he had this carnivorous ego that was just sort of devouring this sort of adulation and riding himself into this hero that he never was in his real life. Who he was in real life was, I feel, even more fascinating than what he tried to propagate, the myth that he created. The, the myth that he created is that basically he was like the Leonardo da Vinci of the modern mind um, that was one of the greatest inventors and thinkers of the last century, you know, that had invented this entire new science that could completely save humanity, literally. Sure, and, and you're talking about Dianetics. Dianetics, but, but before that, that he was a nuclear physicist, a submarine commander, uh, one of the first stated casualties of World War II, went blind, resurrected himself to sight with the powers of his own mind, was a dogfighter, uh, I mean, you know, studied at the feet of, of, was a blood brother to Indians, world travelers, studied at the feet of mystics in the East. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and is, is in some way, I mean, in many, is, is like utterly preposterous. If he would have just had a simple um, origin story would have been far more believable. But I mean, when you kind of march through the L. Ron Hubbard life exhibit, it, it's just absolutely amazing that that he's really trying to make you believe that this all happened in one life. And I think a lot of it is that he, at a certain point, really wanted to be that person. And Scientology was a way for him to write himself into becoming that character. Um, that he had always, you know, written about in his books. I think that he was naturally a storyteller. I think he was a natural-born hustler. He showed a propensity for lies um, at a very early age. Um, he was pr profoundly prolific, um, incredibly intelligent, very cunning. Um, was definitely very aware that he could kind of write himself into many positions of power, and did so from a very early age. I mean, he was possessed with another gift of gab and had a certain sort of magnetism about him that was able to achieve a lot of his will. But I do think that one of the most fascinating aspects about him that's hidden is his whole like period experimenting with black magic and hypnotism. Right. And I know that sounds totally absurd to the regular layman, but it is, it is conclusive in terms of you know, actual black sex magic with Aleister Crowley and so forth. These are not conspiracy theories. This stuff has been validated. In fact, Elrond had to actually even um, acknowledge it to a point where he claimed that he was a secret agent <laughs> sent in to break up this black magic sex ring. But so, Jamie, um, without getting, I want to bring it back to one thing that you had talked sure. about. In the conversations you've had within your family, is there right. a consensus that he never actually believed the stuff about Xenu and the aliens and all of this Scientology kind of teachings? There is, is there a consensus that this was clearly something concocted and that it was not something he even believed? I think that uh, the consensus that, from what I understand that my grandfather held near the end, is that his father was incredibly clever and manipulative, and that was certainly the roots of of Scientology this was that this is a method of controlling people this is a method of mm. breaking people down it's it's an incredibly efficient form of brainwashing the way it completely deconstructs how people connect to reality how can they connect to their community and what I feel that near the end though is that the power that he had had for so long um, and being lost in his own fantasy land for so long that I feel this stuff like Xenu, he was just like further and further down the rabbit hole. Right. The thing was, is that he had to keep coming up with something um, that was, he had to keep dangling the carrot further and further because he's promising you superhuman godlike abilities. Well, unless you are as rich as Tom Cruise and you can maybe convince yourself to that because you that far distance from maybe the regular world for your average person that these abilities don't come and so there's a point where you have to constantly be dangling as to why aren't they coming and, and what happens and so forth sure. to us to a Scientologist the Xenu thing is so significant because it's the first time that you find out that you're not you're not one godlike soul 
being that you've been talking to and listening that that's been inhabiting all these bodies that actually you're a vessel that's being possessed by dead alien parasite it's quite souls. a story yeah right and so you have to spend thousands of dollars to sit in a room <laughs> alone holding electrified juice cans hypnotizing yourself and giving these alien parasitic souls therapy. Yeah, it's now, quite a story. Now, hey, Jamie, there, there's one of the, I, I, we're just so over time and I have to get sure. one more thing in and I think people can look up a lot of that specific uh, procedural stuff. Right. Have Security wise, have you been visited by members of the church because of speaking out? Just kind of quickly give us a summary. Sure, I certainly was the very first time I performed about him. They hunted me down and then they showed up at my mom's house. Um, they had some whole cover story claiming that they were, you know, artists putting on a show with me. And she was able to sort of see through their ruse and kick them off their uh, off her porch. Wow. Uh, since then, since uh, I've, I've been encouraged by many members in the critic community and people who, since I came out with the God and the Man piece that you can find on YouTube um, through Snap Judgment and that performance, that through that a lot of people encouraged me to stay to, to, to continuously stay in the spotlight and talk about it um, and that the second that I would go back in the shadows, I made myself more of a target. Mm. And I think also that the church is taking so many shots now and the press is much like your show has grown balls and or ovaries, so to speak, and are attacking um, without fear. They're exposing it for what it is. And a lot of the, the house of cards is crumbling. And I think that that's giving a lot of safety and strength to a lot of the people that are coming out, a lot of these high-profile celebrities that are leaving. Right. Um, there's less terror. There's less fear because the Internet and you know the, the fact that all this information is out there that you can Google Xenu and have a damn good laugh. Well, 20 years ago, that was far from funny. That was a deadly secret that was you know, in a briefcase handcuffed to members' wrists that you had to spend decades attempting to learn this secret. Right. And now South Park, you can download it in a second, and it's a joke. And by that being of a joke is one of the most dangerous aspects to Scientology is, is I mean, they sell secrets. Now all the secrets are out in the public that it becomes very dangerous for them to attempt to control that flow of information, to attempt to shut it all down. There's, there's too much, there's too many going on at once. They can't stop every single hole. And they certainly don't want to bring more attention to me. All right, Jamie DeWolf, pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks a lot.